Hello, Sports Beat fans, and welcome to the first show of the fall semester. I am your host, Jason Wyke, and we have a jam packed show for you tonight. We start off in the MLB as the hunt for October is heating up across baseball. We then go to the gridiron for an NFL update through the first two weeks of play. After that, we turn our attention to the pride as we welcome in Nico Oberalk and the, of the Hofstra men's soccer team to discuss their successful season so far. And then we will debut a brand new segment for the semester and take a trip around campus to catch up with athletics. And as always, we wrap up by taking a look at the week ahead for the pride. Don't go anywhere, Hofstra fans, because the Herbie Award winning sports beat starts right now. The hunt for October is coming down to the wire throughout Major League Baseball. Joining me now to discuss the playoffs and more is Jack Lydon and Jess Ross. What a season. So many historic moments and perhaps a lot of surprises. Now, to start our discussion, in the MLB this year, there were a lot of teams that people were highly touting. They were very excited about. Maybe you had some teams that you were excited about, but I need to know, of those teams, which one do you think was the biggest disappointment? Who did not show up this year? Yeah, Jason, it's, it's the Los Angeles Angels. I mean, we have this conversation, it seems like, every year. And not that people expected too much from them, but... Come on, this is getting ridiculous, right? They, they finally go for it at the trade deadline. They pick up Lucas Giolito. They pick up C.J. Crone, a couple of relievers. And then they immediately lose seven consecutive games. This franchise is such a disappointment. They have two of the greatest players in Major League Baseball history, and they continue to have horrible seasons. And even though they had a little hope this season, they still end it under 500 out of the playoffs once again. The Angels are a massive disappointment once again. And moving on to the East Coast, the New York Yankees probably had one of the most disappointing seasons I have ever seen, especially when they were expected to do so much better. With their captain, Aaron Judge, out for about two months, that team completely crumbled. And don't even get me started with Giancarlo Stanton just has not showed up for the contract that he has. When you are making $32 million and then you show up with – 114 strikeouts in 96 games. It really, the team is just has crumbled, and I hope that next season they can show up and be a team and not really just focus on these individual players and just do better. We talked about the teams we expected to be good. Now, coming into the year, maybe there are some teams that you didn't think were going to be very good that overperformed how you thought they would do. So I need to know, maybe not a playoff team, but a team that took a step in the right direction. Who did you like this year? The Red Sox for a couple of reasons. Um, primarily because of the development of both Brian Bayo and Tristan Casas. Bayo looks like an upper echelon starting rotation guy, perhaps even an ace for years to come. Tristan Casas has already locked down the first base position in, in, in the Red Sox franchise. He needs to work on the defense, but the, the, the hitting is there. The home runs are there. And secondly, they fired Heim Bloom. They finally got rid of this guy that's been tormenting this franchise for a couple years now. Nobody likes finishing in last place like Heim Bloom, and uh, it's, it's really a step in the right direction that he's gone. You know, I'm going to keep this one short and sweet with a team that really hasn't been on a lot of people's watch, and I hope in the next couple seasons they can. The Washington Nationals, they do not have a great record this season, about 20 games under 500. But I think with the team that they have, they have a lot of strong – they have a lot of potential, and I'm hoping that next season we can really see a team that starts to grow a little stronger. So these were the teams that took the right steps to get better. Now we're going to talk about the players that took the right steps. And really, again, a season filled with so many Herculean performances, really some astonishing things, perhaps that we have never seen before. So I know that this, this is tough to try to narrow it down to just two, but I need to know an MVP for the NL and an MVP for the AL. You could say both, Jack, as you start in your response. Yeah, it's not tough in the American League at all. It's Shohei Otani. He's the best player in Major League Baseball. He might be one of the best players we've ever seen in the sport. You can't argue with a three ERA and 42 home runs. And this is just something we've never seen before. It's something we'll never see maybe out of him again a season like this. He is the runaway American League MVP. In the National League, it gets a little tougher, but I think Ronald Acuna has secured it to this point. Two more home runs last night. He's got one shy of 40 now. He's going to steal 70 bases as well. That's never been done. Acuna is your NL MVP, and uh, Otani takes it home in the AL. 
It would almost be foolish of me to not agree with Jack here. Otani is one of the best or the best ba baseball player we have ever seen. And I'm hoping that, obviously, with his injury now, next season he won't be able to be on the mound, but that won't stop him from being able to hit homer after homer. But going back to Acuna, with 39 home runs and an OPS over 1,000, he seriously is unstoppable. And we're going to see that playoff run from him. And I just think that it is, it, it, again, it's a no-brainer to pick both MVPs. Now, I know you both want to talk about the World Series, and we will. But before talking about the World Series, I need to know the teams behind the smoke screen, the one that you're not talking about as much, it's under the radar, we're talking about the dark horse. Who are your dark horse teams, the teams that if you saw them in the playoffs, you would not want to play? I got to know. I don't want to play the Seattle Mariners if I'm anyone right now. They One through five, their pitching rotation is, I think, second to none in the American League, even better than Houston's. Speaking of Houston, they went down to Minute Maid Park and won five out of six games this season, something that not a lot of teams do in that place. They got swept last year, but they played Houston tremendously in the postseason. Perhaps the best matchup for Seattle in this postseason is Houston because of how much of a chip on their, on their shoulder they have from last year and going into this year, the success they've had against them, especially on the road. Let's talk about the Baltimore Orioles, a team that not many people have talked about in the last years because there really hasn't been much to talk about. But, you know, yes, they are number one in the AL East right now. But with that, that team is so strong, so young. And I feel a lot of people are kind of looking past them. They haven't been in the playoffs since 2016. And all, it's a fresh team. And I think with people like Mullins and Hayes, they just have a really good team to be able to make that run. And I think they can go all the way. We well, talked about runs, talk about going all the way. I need to know, come November, who will be crowned the kings of the MLB? I'm sorry to be boring. I really am. But it's going to be Atlanta and Houston, and Atlanta is going to take it home in seven. Top to bottom, the Atlanta Braves have the best roster, lineup, pitching rotation. Their back of the bullpen's a little, little iffy, but especially their lineup, one through nine. There's no holes. In that, there's no holes in that lineup. No holes barely in their roster in general. I think Houston gets out of a weak American League this year, but they are outlasted in seven because Atlanta is going to get home field advantage. And I do love an underdog story, and I honestly would love to see the Baltimore Orioles take this World Series. It would come out of nowhere from literally left field. So I think, why not? The Orioles and the Braves World Series, Orioles in Game 7, because why not? That sounds like fun. Sounds like a lot of fun, and I can't wait for this World Series. That will do it for our MLB discussion. From a league that is winding down to one that is just starting up, the first two weeks of the NFL season have been filled with action. Here's Amani Washington with your NFL update. Hey, Sports Beat fans. I'm Imani Washington, and this is your NFL update. The first two weeks of the season have been eventful, so let's get right into it. After losing star quarterback Aaron Rodgers to an Achilles injury less than five minutes into the regular season, the New York Jets turned to third-year QB Zach Wilson to lead the huddle against their division rivals, the Buffalo Bills. Although it was rookie Xavier Gibson who stole the show in week one with an electrifying walk-off punt return for a touchdown to secure the win for Gang Green. Week two was not so kind for the Jets as Zach Wilson threw for three interceptions against the Dallas Cowboys en route to a 30-10 Jets loss. From gangrene to big blue, the New York Giants stumbled out of the gate against the Dallas Cowboys, dropping their season opener in primetime 40-0 against their bitter division rivals. Week two looked to be playing out a similar way as the Giants entered halftime facing a 20-0 deficit against the Arizona Cardinals. However, Daniel Jones and crew were able to mount the largest comeback in team history since 1949, overcoming a 28-7 deficit in the third quarter to come away with a 31-28 win and 1-1 record. Staying in the NFC East, the Dallas Cowboys, Philadelphia Eagles, and Washington Commanders have put the league on notice as all three teams have gotten off to a 2-0 start to the young season. Dak Prescott and the Cowboys put on the most dominant display so far, scoring 70 total points through the first two weeks while only allowing 10. Throughout the rest of the league, the Atlanta Falcons, Tampa Bay Buccaneers, New Orleans Saints, San Francisco 49ers, Baltimore Ravens, and Miami Dolphins have all gotten off to hot starts, going 2-0 to start their 2023 campaign. With your NFL update, I'm Imani Washington, and Sportsbeat will be right back with more after this.
when it's Thursday night and you've got nothing to do We got a little show that you can get into Get your coat on, put your vape pen away See the funniest thing that you'll see all day We've got Skyler, Emily, and Dustin, so odd, and Jake Look out for Jade and Richie's Thursday news break Yeah, there's twiggles, jiggles, giggles, music, sometimes cocaine I love math Mob therapy, adultery, and spilling champagne if you don't watch TNL, you're going straight to somewhere bad. Hello and welcome back to Sports Beat. The Hofstra men's soccer team has gotten off to a hot start this year, touting a 5-1 and 2 record on the young season. Our own Antonio Schoenhart is now joined by Nico Oberauk. As Savidra plays at a now it's played deep. Carmichael scores it with the shot. Carmichael scores. In the 2022 center in possession, there is that one is rolled home. Carmichael to the near post, and it's in. The Goldthorpe on the far side. Goldthorpe, a shot. That is in. A shot in, and it is in to the back of the net. Farrell, Farrell plays that down to Carmichael. Carmichael gets around Savidra. Cross, that is Nico, first and foremost, I want to thank you for joining us here in studio for this live interview. And I want to talk about your high school days to begin with, going all the way back to Italy. I know you attended the Institute of Paritario a Ruiz, right, in Italy. So growing up through your youth in Italy, how has that not only given you your love for the sport, but your soccer identity? Yeah, of course, it's very different than the system that we are used here in the U.S. where you go to school and then you have the sports that is correlated to the school you're going to. In Italy, we have a system where you will go to a school, public or private, in the morning, and then you will head to your team or academy or practice in the afternoon. Gotcha. And so now to switch from high school days now here to the college days, Hofs are probably off to a great start, 5-1-2 and two on the season, but both draws coming in conference play. What do you think the team has to do to get those much-needed conference wins? I mean, I think we are on the right path, and we just need to keep doing what we're doing, keep working hard. And uh, in difficult moments, it's very important that uh, the team is really tucking together and we are positive to each other. Now, uh, to talk about Saturday's match, it was really emotional end there with your teammate Elliot Goldthorpe uh, scoring and literally at the death within the last minute. Um, how does that reflect the don't quit mentality of the squad that you guys have? Just a little bit of instinct that uh, everyone has inside. Uh, we have a plan for each game and we try to keep the plan all the way through the 90 minutes and more of the games to, to get the win or to get uh, as many points as possible out of the game. So coaches obviously play a huge role in the mentality and the making of a mentality and character of a team. How would you say your coach has done just that? I mean, he's done it pretty well. He's been here for enough years, so he wouldn't be still here if uh, what he's doing wasn't great. And uh, it just, uh, in just like a learning moment every time he talks. Was. So to stay on the topic of past matches, yesterday, last afternoon, you guys actually took on the LIU Sharks and a very decisive victory, 3-0, right? Exactly. Um, a lot of goals to score. Uh, how does that show the, act, the really good caliber of this offense that you guys have created? Yeah, I think uh, this year in particular we have uh, talent all over the place, uh, uh, even guys that don't play much on the bench. Uh, but it's very important uh, that we do our work and uh, it shows up on the field. Once we work hard uh, and everyone is tucked in and focused on his job, then the quality that we have shows up on the field. So as a defender, your mindset's not too much focused on scoring the goals, but instead preventing them. Um, how, what has it been that's made this back line just gel so well during these matches? I mean, we have our little moments uh, during the last game, but uh, I think it's uh, the work that, uh, that we do during practice. Uh, practice are very intense. Everyone is very focused on getting the job done and uh, improve day by day. So as a senior on the squad, you've obviously been here around here for a long time. Uh, how would you say you've conducted yourself as a leader and as a role model for the rest of, especially the, the, the younger uh, players on the squad? Yeah, I always try to, to be more than, more than a leader, a friend, especially to the new guys that are not very used to college life, more the college life than the actual uh, soccer side. So just try to be myself and uh, help everyone to get the most of it. 
So you're a senior now, but there was once a time where you were in a senior. So when you were in their shoes, uh, were there any players or coaches or anyone on the team specifically that uh, kind of was that role model for you? I always be lucky enough to have uh, good, uh, good coaches and good uh, leader on the team that I was uh, looking up. Uh, the fresher sample that I have is uh, our current captains, Rock Carls and uh, uh, Stefan Mazo, which are perfect example of what a leader should be. Perfect. Um, so you've had you've had a few good matches. Only one loss so far throughout the entire season. Uh, if you had to pick an opponent that you guys have played so far, uh, who would you say your toughest opponent's been, and, and, and what made them so 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 hard to play against? Uh, I would say probably the game that we lost uh, against FDU was pretty tough. They were very uh, competitive. They were very they really wanted more in that case than us. And I would also say Stony Brook had a really good performance against us. So while no one likes to lose, losing can actually give you a lot of insight and help you learn more as a team. Uh, what would you say you guys have taken away from those two matches? Well, for sure, the aspect to don't give up until the end has, uh, has been shown in the last game. And just to take care of the little, small little details that uh, at the end of the game will make the difference between winning and losing. Uh, so now to, this is kind of just a broad question, but to, to generalize, uh, a lot of people have a lot of deferring opinions on uh, NCAA Division I soccer. Uh, what would you have to say to those people who think that playing Division I soccer at the college level is a walk in the park? Well, I thought the same when I first came here, and then uh, for season it was clear that it wasn't like, like people think. It's actually very hard to play a lot of games uh, in a row, and a lot of players now are coming from Europe, uh, which is good because it increased the, the level and the quality of the players. So it's a very competitive tournament, I would say. So how would you say exactly, how surprised would uh, your Italian friends and, and family back in Italy be if they saw and they came over here to the United States and saw the caliber of play that you guys are playing on a weekly basis? Yeah, as I said, uh, at the beginning it was very more like uh, uh, in Europe is better or stuff like that. But then when, once you see it uh, with your eyes, you realize that it's not like that. Well, Nico, I want to thank you again for joining us here in studio for this interview. And don't go anywhere because after this short break, Sports Beat's going to be right back. Hofstra today. I'm your anchor Amelia Sack and I'm your weather anchor Natalia Suaza. We are honored to be Hofstra University's source of local and national news on campus. We are here to deliver the latest updates in weather, sports, entertainment, national news, and what's going on at and around Hofstra today. Be sure to check us out on Select Wednesdays on the Lawrence Herbert School of Communication YouTube channel at 1.30 p.m. Welcome, folks, to our brand new segment called the Hofstra Pride Top 5. This is our top five plays throughout Hofstra Athletics. Without further ado, let's jump right in. Number five, volleyball. Mary Mack, they're trying to make a comeback. They get a free ball here in Ashton Oliver and Mary Haji Petru. It's too easy. You can't stop that. Hofstra Pride out big here. They're able to take it three sets to nil. And I just need you to see this player. Perfect positioning by Oliver and Haji Petru with the easy tap there to go past the line. Hofstra Pride Volleyball, we'll be talking about them real soon. Field hockey, towards the end of their game versus Wagner, they got a penalty corner. Bonell, Richardson, McNally. Look at that laser beam. That's a play so nice, we got to watch it twice. Now I want you to just see how good this tic-tac-toe, this set right there by Richardson, and then McNally just absolutely destroys that ball. Back in the net, Hofstra Pride take it 2-0, beat Wagner. Again, just a great sequence there. Unselfish play by the Pride. We go now back to volleyball. Usually it's 25 points in a set. This one, it's up to 34. You gotta win it by two. Elon just trying to stay alive. Kuko up into the sky to Alves, and then Braga 
forces the violation, and Elon gives up the point. Look how pumped up these ladies are. Let's get another look at this one in slow-mo to see Kuko puts that ball so high in the sky, all best, and then Braga just slamming that ball down and the crease violation. This Hofstra Pride Volleyball team you're gonna to wanna to look out for. Only one loss on the year, they are something special. Another team that is fantastic, women's soccer, five straight wins. Matilda Braithwaite, she's coming in. Whoop, past the defender, goalie sprawling out. Now Davies gets the ball, she's trying to look, she can't, so Victoria Frank does. She gets the goal, the London, England native. Look at her bang the drums there in celebration. This team is fired up, and we're gonna take a look in slow-mo again. Woo, right past the defender. Goalie's just trying to stop it. The defense now in desperation mode, and Victoria Franck sitting there waiting, sniffs out the goal. Ba, 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 ba. That's enough to give the Hofstra pride the 1-0 victory versus St. Joe's. And now we have to take a look at another very exciting team, Hofstra men's soccer, Elliot Goldthorpe. Let's see the golden boy with the goal. This was his second of the day, tied it up versus Campbell, less than a minute remaining and he wins here with speed. Teddy Baker feeding him perfectly. Look, the goalie's nowhere to be found. That's how fast this guy is. He was the CAA Offensive Player of the Week. Three goals and an assist. And best part about that, it was your number 24 nationally ranked Hofstra Pride. And that is our Pride Top 5. Now, another team that I just brought up was the Hofstra Volleyball team and they're off to a red hot start. Our very own Jake Epstein took a trip to their match this past weekend and all around campus to catch up with the Pride faithful and get their thoughts on the hot start. What's up, Sportsbeat fans? I'm Jake Epstein. Back on the street, Hofstra Athletics are off to a hot start. Hofstra Volleyball specifically, they're doing their best that they've ever done since 1988. We're back on campus, ready to talk to the best fans in the world here on the campuses of Hofstra University. So what did you just see out of the Hofstra volleyball team there? It's the hottest start since the late 80s for them. What do you hope to see for them the rest of the way? Well, we're in an absolutely amazing game. This is the first opportunity I've had to come to a game this year. But they just uh, won a game something like 36 to 34, something like that. They have incredible uh, persistence and a very strong team. And you can tell they're really working well together. There's a buzz on campus today because the Hofstra women's volleyball team is taking on Elon in what is set to be an exciting game. Let's go see how some of our fans here in the Student Center stack up against some of our athletes. Now Kai, the Hofstra women's volleyball team is off to a hot start. What do you know about volleyball? You hit the ball over a net. Good. Okay, so we're <laughs> off to a good start. So now I'm going to introduce a brand new segment to Sports Beat, Unispan Volleyball. Could you show us uh, how to hit a volleyball? Like if I, if I like, you know, show you right there, can you, show, can you hit it up? Yeah. I want you to, to do your best, hit the ball up the Unispan. Go, Kai, go. Yeah. <laughs> Do you like volleyball? I do, yeah. Are you interested in playing Unispan Volleyball? I love it. Right. Just as far okay. as you can. Yeah, whatever, whatever, we can. whatever you like. All right, here we go. Trevor, can you tell me, what do you love about Hofstra Sports? Well, there's always so much energy in the crowd, you know? There's so much life and liveliness that you really just feel it when you go there, you know? That's what I love about Hofstra Sports. And right now, the Hofstra women's volleyball team is doing the best that they've done to start a season since the late 80s. What do you know about volleyball? Um, my friends used to play in high school, so I know like the basic rules, but that's about it. For five dollars, five dollars, for five dollars, can you name the three basic hits in volleyball? A bump, a set, and a spike. Boom. Thank you. Oscar, you're the band captain. What did you play out there to get the, the team and the fans hyped today? So today we played um, at the beginning Feel It Still after the first um, set, which was really intense because we we made it past 30, which um, it's pretty good. It's pretty intense over there. If we played Feel It Still, 
and um, we played a couple of other tunes. We played um, Runaway. We played we played a couple of songs over there. And that is game time. After a tough match, Hofstra University women's volleyball team continues their hot streak with a win over Elon in three straight sets. The fans on this campus are pumped up to see what they can do and the rest of the teams can do this season. For Sports Beat, I'm Jake Epstein from the David S. Mack Physical Education Building. <laughs> Yeah. Back and do it. Is that there, rocket in your way? There's some rocks in there. I don't think fast you think better. Like, I'm getting as fast, fast as, as I can. Home. What are you doing? Yeah, I think doing more sound effects like that probably will help you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Caitlin, there it is. I found it. I found it. Well, let me no. see. How many goals? Well, well golly! golly. Hey guys, it's me, Isabella Gomez, filling in for Smokey Bear because he's got more to say than just... Only you can prevent wildfires. Like, if you're outside enjoying a barbecue, don't let a hamburger distract you from fire safety. Make sure you aren't dumping your hot coals or ashes onto the ground because that could start a wildfire. So take wildfire prevention seriously and let's save the world one day at a time. Juntos con Smokey Bear, podemos hacerlo. Go to SmokeyBear.com to learn more about wildfire prevention. Hey Sports Beat fans, I'm Amelia Bashi and welcome to this edition of the Pride Weekly Update. The semester may be starting, but the Pride is already making their presence known, so let's get right into it. Women's soccer looks to extend their win streak to six on the road as they head down south for two matches this week. Tomorrow night, they take on the struggling Charleston Cougars. Victoria Franck has set the tone for the Pride with eight points during Hofstra's five-match win streak. Kickoff is set for 7 p.m., then on Sunday, the Pride travel to Wilmington to take on the UNCW Seahawks. The Sunday matinee will kick off at noon. On Friday, field hockey hosts Long Island University as Hofstra looks to bounce back from a heartbreaking 1-0 loss to the ranked Delaware Blue Hens. Game time against the Sharks is set for 3 p.m. The women's tennis team takes a trip to West Point this weekend as they compete in the Army West Point Invitational. Matches are scheduled all day, Friday through Sunday. Also this weekend, the Red Hot volleyball team will look to continue their historic start to the season as they travel up to Boston to take on the Northeastern Huskies for two matches. Hofstra is currently tied for the most wins in the nation with an impressive 12-1 record. They put their match win streak on the line at 2 p.m. Saturday and Sunday. Back in Hempstead, the men's soccer team will battle in a rematch of last year's CAA quarterfinals as the Pride look to once again vanquish William & Mary. 2022 CAA Player of the Year Ryan Carmichael has, a rec has recorded a point in every match, but won this year to lead Hofstra to a 5-1-2 to to two record so far. For more information on schedules, live streams, and more, visit GoHofstra.com. And that will do it for us tonight on Sportsbeat. But before we wrap up, there are many thanks to go around. A special thank you to Nico Oberauk, the Hofstra men's soccer team, for joining us in studio. Jake Epstein brought you through Hofstra's campus and around the world of Hofstra volleyball. Amani Washington, Amelia Bashi brought you your sports updates. And Jess Ross and Jack Lydon up previewed the upcoming MLB playoffs. I'm your host, Jason Wyke. Thank you so much for spending your night with us. And remember to always roar with pride.